Every day, the clock tower rings at the same time. 2.30 p.m. When it chimes, everyone retreats inside, closing their doors and shuttering their windows. It's been the same tradition since our grandparents were children, and it will likely continue until my children's children are old. We've never questioned why. I still remember the first time that I was old enough to actually understand that the chiming wasn't normal. I had seen plenty of TV shows, and none of them had any sort of chime time, as we had grown to call it. So, what was so special about our town? I couldn't have been older than four or five. I remember that I was playing in my front yard next to the driveway. Our old colonial style home sat behind me as I pushed a small Tonka truck over a mound of dirt. Brrr, I said, making my best attempt at a big rig engine sound. I was cut off from my imaginative entertainment by a deep ringing echoing through the town. Jacob, I heard my mom call through the window of the kitchen. It wasn't a fearful call. There wasn't the slightest bit of anxiety in her voice when she said it. Time to come inside. I stood up, holding my Tonka truck and staring down the street. A group of kids a few houses down were playing in a sprinkler when the bell sounded. They quickly abandoned the whirling water, and they ran inside. I remember thinking that playing in a sprinkler would be nice on such a hot Arizona day. Where is everyone going? I thought, trying to comprehend what was happening. I turned around and I stepped off, ready to head inside, when I saw my mom storming out of the house. The look on her face was that of worry and a deep concern, a sharp contrast to the tone that she had beckoned me with earlier. Jacob, she scolded, you were told to come inside. It is 2.32. We've only got three minutes. You've got to get inside now. She had begun to yell, a telltale sign that something was wrong. She pressed against my shoulder, moving me quickly up the sidewalk that led to the front door. Mom, what's going on? I asked with piqued curiosity. She remained silent, nudging me to continue moving into the house. As we made our way up the wooden steps of the wraparound porch, I found myself unmoving unwilling to take another step without answers. Mom, I demanded, making sure my tone was noticed and acknowledged. It is chime time, Jacob. Her tone was exasperated. Now, you need to get inside right now. We can't be out here. We've only got one minute left and your father needs help shuttering the windows. She quickly pushed past me and into the front door of the house. She held it open for a moment, but I just stood on the front porch, arms crossed and a look of disapproval on my young face that said, I'm not going anywhere until I get some answers. Jacob. I heard my father's deep voice billow out one of the back rooms in the house. Get in the house now, damn it. He rarely swore, and never when he spoke to me. And this was enough to tell me that he was serious. I hung my head and sheepishly entered the house. Go up to your room, my mom said as she lowered a large piece of plywood down from the ceiling. It was attached to the window frame next to the front door. By a hinge and it only needed to be swung down and secured with a wing nut to hold it in place. 
After she finished shattering the small windows on either side of the door, she secured two 2x4s to the front door in small pockets on either side of the door jam. I did as I was told. Opting to not get myself into any more trouble than I already had. I made my way to my bedroom, climbing up the old stairs that creaked and groaned with each step. I opened the door to my bedroom, peering into the darkness. The room was void of any natural light due to the windows being covered, but the overhead light would still work. I flipped the switch, turning the room from bitter blackness to a warm, soft white glow. I walked over and I plopped down on the bed, reaching for a small basket of Legos on the floor. I noticed a sound. It was something like a distant scratching. As it gained volume, it began to sound more like static. The hissing continued to penetrate my ears until it became overbearing, deafening me to the world around me. The floor began to vibrate beneath me, my bed shaking as if I were caught in some sort of earthquake. Mom! Dad! I shouted trying to be louder than the horrible noise flooding my ears, but it was of no use. I jumped from my bed and I took off, sprinting out of the room and down the stairs, where both my parents sat on the couch in the living room. They sat together, cuddling close to each other, and staring at the door with an unsettled expression. Mom? I asked, still having to shout. She turned her head, and I noticed a vacant expression on her face. Her eyes were red, her cheeks swollen. I could tell that she had been crying. It'll be over soon, sweetheart, she replied in a shaky voice. And then you can go play again. What's happening? I yelled, ignoring her generic statement. She looked at me for a moment. Her eyes fell to the floor, and she turned her head back to the door. I didn't know what to do, how to feel, if I should worry or go about my merry way. The plywood covered the door and windows continued vibrating. The sound boomed through the house. It felt as if it would never end. And then all of a sudden, Everything went quiet. The movement in the windows and doors finally ceased, and everything fell into an eerie calm. My mom and dad simply rose from their seats and began removing the fortification, as if this was just another routine chore that was required to be done daily. I stared for a moment, unsure if I should ask. I knew if I didn't, it would nag at me, that I wouldn't be able to sleep at night without answers. What was that? My mom looked to my dad who returned the exchange with a furrowed brow. He looked back at me before letting out a deep, heavy sigh. He slowly walked over, kneeling down and placing his hand on my shoulder. I wish I knew, son. He sounded exasperated and defeated. I could tell by his tone and the look in his eyes that he genuinely had no clue, and I knew that pressing the subject would only result in frustration and possibly yelling. I decided to drop it, even though my mind raced with endless possibilities. What was it? What happened every day at 2.30? It didn't take long for me to come to the conclusion that I would find out. Whatever it was would no longer be a mystery. The next day, just as expected, the bell sounded at 2.30 and I made my way inside. My mom and dad barricaded the door, 
lowered the plywood over the windows and sat on the couch, just like they did every day. I went to my room, no longer afraid, but curious. I sat on my bed and, just as expected, by 2.35, the horrible noise had begun. The shutter covering my single window began to shake on its hinge. The rattling became more and more apparent as the sound grew louder. I reached down, grasping the small nut at the end of the long bolt that protruded from below the shutter, and I began to turn it counterclockwise. It was tight, requiring great effort before it would finally give. Once it did, it seemed to fly off. My heart nearly burst as the excitement surged through my body. The plywood covering it began to flap as an intense wind blew in from outside. I slowly lifted it, and what I saw, I will never forget. An intense and unwarranted storm had engulfed the view outside. The sky was no longer warm with sunlight. The blue had been replaced by a white, static fuzz. The same type of snowy scene that took over the TV screen on a dead channel, speckled with dots of black, white, and gray. It seemed to remove any sunlight from the sky, plunging the world below into an eerie black. The horrific hissing sound became unconceivably loud. My hand shot up, covering my ears. I snapped my eyes shut and I let out a shrill scream, but the sound was lost in the static. As I slowly opened my eyes, I saw something, something out in the storm. It was a man, or at least the shape of a man. A bright white light emanated from behind him. I knew he was looking at me. He was seeing me. Likely, the only person in town who had their window open. He had begun to approach, slowly coming towards my house. He seemed to float in the air, like a mystic deity traversing the landscape. As he drew closer, the sound of static gained volume. Suddenly, I felt something come from behind me. I jumped startled by the appearance of the man. It was my father, and the look on his face was desperate and furious. He whipped the plywood down, fighting the incoming force. He struggled to press it down against the small bolt that stuck out of the wall beneath it. I could feel the floating man coming closer. I could feel his intent, malice and evil. My father continued forcing the plywood down, shouting something that I could not make out. He reached a hand out in front of me, his palm up. The knot! I finally heard over the noise. I frantically searched the floor below, before finally seeing that shining piece of silver. As I knelt down to pick it up, I heard the man outside calling to me again. Jacob. He said longingly. His voice felt as if it were only inside my head. Come with me. I snatched the wing nuts off the floor and handed it to my father in a frantic motion. He quickly spun it onto the bolt, the plywood beating against him as he did. I looked over at my clock. 2.39. As the number changed over to 2.40, everything went silent. My father breathed a sigh of relief, the worry on his face slowly dissipating into a pale vacancy of emotion. Son, he finally said after a moment, that is why we stay inside during chime time. 
I learned that night to never question the quirks of my small town. I learned that, despite the enigmatic nature, if I followed the rules, then I had nothing to worry about. I've managed to keep the tradition going through the years. My son hasn't seemed to regard chime time yet, but I imagine it's only a matter of time.